Welcome everybody. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick glimpse of just a few of the new features available in the beta for Photoshop CS6. There's a ton of new stuff, not only for photographers, but a lot of things for designers and illustrators and other groups. So I'm just going to focus on a few, and I'm not going to take the time to go into all of the details. The first thing I want to show you is the new Content Aware Patch Tool. So in this photo here, I've made a quick selection of these objects on the bottom left that I want to remove. You could use any selection technique. You could, you could use the patch tool itself. I'm going to go ahead and click on the healing section here and choose the patch tool. Now let's first take a look at the old patch tool, the normal patch tool. As I click and drag this to sample from the top center here, you're going to see that it pulls in from the edges. It bleeds. So that was an issue that we always had working up against edges with the patch tool. I'm going to do Ctrl or Command Z to undo that. And I'm going to switch this now from normal to content aware. Now when I do this, it gives me the option to sample all layers. That is a beautiful thing. What that means is that I don't have to work directly on the background layer. I can do my work on a separate layer above this so that my work can be undone, so that it's non-destructive. Okay. So I've selected the Content Aware Patch Tool. I'm going to click and drag to sample from the top center here. And you're going to see once it does whatever kind of math it needs to do, that it does a great job of filling in that area appropriately. I'll do Ctrl or Command D to deselect. And of course, I could do the same thing here with this, this top area here. I might need to be a little more careful in that selection along the edge of the saxophone there. but without the pressure of doing it as I'm recording the video, I'm sure I could do a fine job. And in fact, it did a fine job. Okay, so that's the Content Aware Patch Tool, a fabulous addition. Let's go ahead and look at the Content Aware Move Tool. Now, when I photographed this woman on the beach, I didn't realize that the line of the water was crossing the top of her body or her head here. So I want to move her down away from that horizontal line. Again, I've made a quick selection. I used the Quick Selection tool, and I expanded the selection by a few pixels. But you could use any selection tool. Now here in the toolbar, the Healing section, I'm going to click and hold, and I'm going to choose Content Aware Move. Now again, with Content Aware Move, I can work on a blank layer above the background layer. That way I can throw away my work if I come back later and I don't like it. I'll choose Sample All Layers, and I will, in fact, choose to move rather than extend. Now I'm simply going to go ahead and click and drag her. Once it finishes the math, you're going to see that it does a good job. It did a great job of fitting her in to the new colors and pattern down here in the corner. It left a little bit here that I need to clean up with the clone stamp tool or the healing brush, but that won't take me any time at all. It really did a pretty good job of filling in all of these areas where she was. Now you can also extend or copy using this tool. So I'm going to do Ctrl or Command Z and then Alt or Option Ctrl or Command Z again to undo the work that I did. And instead of Move, I'm going to choose to Extend. Now with Extend, you can click and drag a little bit to make something wider. I don't think that she would appreciate this in this example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click and drag and create a second copy. I'll put it down here. Now, Extend could be useful if you want to extend the end of a building, for example. And I'll do Ctrl or Command D to deselect. And again, it, it fit her into the new environment down here very well. Now, I have to say that as I, I was preparing for this video, I tried lots of examples that didn't work so well before I came to this one that worked just about perfectly. So I would encourage you to, to challenge it, to try different examples, learn its capabilities, there's some additional functionality here in terms of how strict the adaptation is. I'm going to go ahead and move on to what may seem like a small feature, but that I consider a powerful one for photographers, and that's the ability to select skin tones. So let's say in this headshot here by my friend John Cornicello that I want to shift the color of the skin tones without shifting the color of the entire photograph. Now in Lightroom, I would do this with the adjustment brush. But it would be hard to be precise, because I'd have to be painting around the hair. If I'm in Photoshop doing other things, or if I want precision in my selection, I'm going to do it here with this new functionality. I'm going to go ahead and click on the background layer, click on Select, and choose Color Range. 
Now color range has been around for a long time. That's nothing new. What's new is in the drop down here, I can choose to select skin tones. Notice that the, what's in white here is the selection. So look how amazingly precise it is with selecting skin tones. I can adjust the fuzziness to specify what range I want to consider. I do get a little bit of the shoulder because the light is hitting that, that shoulder, but I can always paint that out later. This will be perfectly fine for my purpose. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. Now I have, in a second, I'll have a selection of the skin tones. So with that selection active, I'm going to add a color balance layer and I'm going to shift the skin tones away from magenta towards green. Of course, if I go really far, you can see it's very obvious, but of course I want to be more subtle than that. And then I can, if you look at my face there, as I turn the eyeball on and off, you can see that in fact, I am just shifting the skin tones. Too far to green in my opinion, but to be able to do that that quickly is amazing. Here's the mask itself. If I alter option, click on the mask, you can see what a, a beautiful mask it's created. Of course, I could always take a black brush and I could paint out areas that, that were selected that shouldn't have been. So I'll alter option, click back on that. We're back to the photo. Now when I created the color balance adjustment layer, it popped open this properties panel. So the properties panel is new in CS6. It contains all of the settings for whatever adjustment layer you're using. So I have a levels layer here. If I click on the levels layer, here are all my settings for that layer. So a handy new single place for all of your adjustments that can be managed like a regular panel. I'm going to collapse that. And I'm going to move on to the next example here. I'll go to this photo and we'll talk about the new blur filter functionality. So let's say in this case that I want to leave the boat sharp, but I want to blur out most of the rest of this photo. I'm going to go ahead and select my pixel layer here, and then I'll go up to filter, blur, and I have a few new choices here. I'm going to choose iris blur for the example, and I get this on-screen preview and controls. To me, this is just a little bit reminiscent of Nick filters and controls. And I like that Photoshop is going in this direction as well. So I can click on this center control to move the center of this filter. I can change the shape of the filter by clicking and dragging. Click and drag on this square here to make it more rectangular versus more circular. So I have a lot of control over this. And I'm seeing a live dynamic preview, which is fabulous. There's no guessing involved here. I can hold the Option key down and I can bring these individual pins in to say that I want to completely protect the boat. And I can go from there to fine tune it. I can also click and drag on the circle here to specify how much blur I want around the filter. Now, of course, I can go on from here and make it look more attractive than it does at the moment. But if I type H, I can hide that to see my work. And I've got a preview check mark up in the top right here to see the effect. Now I can add as many of these filters to my photo as I want. Let's say that this out of focus bird, I actually want to be in focus. I'm going to go ahead and click on that bird to add a new filter. And I'm going to click and drag to make this filter very small. And what it's doing is it's offsetting the original filter. So if I hold the H key down, you'll see that that bird is now in focus. And of course I could do the same thing over here with the, the light lighthouse if I wanted that to be in focus. There's also a field blur section and a tilt shift section to mimic kind of toy camera looks. So I would encourage you to experiment with those as well. But I love these on-screen displays and previews. You'll also find this in the lighting effects filter. If that's one that you used to use and that you missed in Photoshop CS5, on-screen dynamic previews. Now in general, the performance of Photoshop CS6 from my time with it is excellent. It's just very snappy, very responsive. One thing that is just amazingly responsive is the liquify filter. If you use liquify a lot, you're going to love this. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this blur filter here. And I'm going to go up to filter, liquify. Notice first of all that I have a huge brush. And if I click on the brush size, that I'm still very small compared to the new maximum. So you can have as large of a brush as you want. This used to be a real limitation. So let me go ahead and make, get it a little bit smaller. And then I'll click and drag. And notice just how incredibly responsive this is. It's instant. So no matter how large your adjustments, you see an instant preview of your work. 
Now, when you hit OK, it will take a little bit of time to process all of that, but at least you're not waiting for Liquify um, to constantly update. And you'll see this with other filters as well, but that's where it's always been the biggest frustration for me. Let's go ahead and move on to one last thing I want to cover, and that's video support. Now, I didn't think that I would be interested in covering video support because, frankly, the only videos I've ever shot are with my iPhone, my digital SLR doesn't shoot video, but I know a lot of you are doing amazing videos with your digital SLRs. And once I saw how easy it is to use this functionality in Photoshop, I've become more excited about trying my hand at video. Now, video used to only be supported in the extended version of Photoshop. It's now in the basic version as well. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the timeline here at the bottom. I have a video here that I captured with my camera. If I go through it very quickly here in the timeline, you'll see that it's just people walking down the street. So I have a nice, easy-to-use timeline. My video is a layer here. I can add additional video clips very easily, clicking on the plus. I can cut out any pieces of the video that I want to using the timeline here. I can add another audio track. I can mute the video, etc. I can also use almost all of Photoshop's adjustment layers and many of the filters as well, as well as add text and graphics. So it gets very exciting at that point. So I'm going to go ahead and add some text to this video. So I'm going to click here, and I'm just going to type Seattle. And I'll go ahead and click on the T again. And I'm going to drag this text here in the Layers panel above the video group so it sits on a separate layer here in the timeline. Now, it happens to be, based on how I started it, out past the video. That's why the screen went blank. Not a big deal. I'll just drag it back in here, and we'll move on the timeline to the beginning. And now I've got the video starting out with the title. Now, right now, it abruptly drops off after five seconds. I want it to fade off. So I'm going to click on this Fade button here, and I'm going to drag a fade right down into the Seattle text on the timeline. Now you'll see if I go through this at high speed that, in fact, that it starts to fade out, and then it disappears. Next thing I'm going to do is convert this video to black and white. So I'm going to add an adjustment layer black and white adjustment layer. And we'll just accept the default black and white conversion. But you know, I don't want the whole video to be black and white. Again, I just want it to start out in black and white. And then I want it to fade to color. So I've moved my black and white layer here. I've dragged it to make it shorter. And now I'm going to add another fade into that. So now you'll see as I go through the video quickly, it starts out in black and white with the title. And you'll see that the, I start to introduce a little bit of color as it fades into the color version. Now you can also apply filters to your videos. So I haven't shown you the new oil painting filter yet, but you can use it on your photos as well as your videos. So what I'm going to do first is on this video layer, I'm going to right click and convert it to a smart object so that I have more control over my filter. And then I'm going to go up to Filter and down to Oil Paint. And you'll see that you have lots of controls in the oil paint filter to fine tune the look of your photo or your video. I'm just going to go ahead and accept the default settings and say OK. And now I've got that filter applied to my video. If I scroll through the timeline here, it gets a little jumpy. Photoshop is having to calculate that oil painting filter on every single frame of my video. When I export this, when I render it, it will bake it in, and when other people watch it and when you watch it outside of Photoshop, you won't see that jumpiness. So that's as far as I'm going to go with the video functionality, but it just encourages me to start playing more with video. So I'm excited about that. Okay, so I could go on to other features as well, but I'm going to limit it to these. I hope this has gotten you excited about Photoshop CS6. Every time I think that I may abandon Photoshop because Lightroom is so powerful, they just keep adding more new and powerful features that convince me to stay with the program as a supplemental tool.